Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be giving you a quick review of the game Grand Austria Hotel, published in 2015 by Mayfair Games. In this review video, first of all, I'm going to be giving you a quick overview of the rules, then I'm going to be telling you about the things that I liked and didn't like about the game, in the hope that this helps you make a decision to see whether this is the kind of game you'd like. Thanks very much to Mayfair Games for providing me with a copy of this game. In Grand Austria Hotel, you are a hotelier in the city of Vienna at the beginning of the 20th century. Guests are going to come to your restaurant, where you must provide them with the food and drink they desire. And then, assuming you have the appropriate room ready for them, they'll stay in your hotel and give you victory points. This is your hotel board. These tiles indicate that the room has been prepared and is ready for a guest. When a guest moves to a room, you'll flip the tile over and it'll score you points at the end of the game, depending on what floor of the hotel the room is in. Your guests are here. The icons in the top left of the card indicate what they want, which is cake, strudel, wine or coffee. In the top right of the card are the victory points you're going to get once you've fulfilled all the needs, and also on the bottom of the card is the bonus that you get when that guest stays in your hotel. The game's played over seven rounds. At the start of the round, all the dice are rolled and placed onto the matching action spaces of the board. Then, in player order, each player takes an action by choosing one of the dice. And then in reverse player order, each player gets to do a second action. So, seven rounds of the game and you get to do two actions per round. So that's only 14 actions in total for the whole game. So you've got to make every one count. The die you choose determines the action you take. When you select a die, you get to perform that action a number of times equal to the number of dice on that action space. So if I choose to take this one die here, I get to perform this action three times, because there's three dice there, and then I take the die. This action is taking strudel and cake, so I get to take three cubes. However, notice the iconography here. The number of brown cubes I take must be equal to or greater than the number of white cubes. So I could take three strudel, or in this case, I'm going to take two strudel and one cake. The cubes I take can be placed on any guests I currently have. Any extra go into the kitchen. Action space two is similar, but you take wine and coffee, which are the red and the black cubes. Action three allows you to prepare a number of rooms. You pay for each room, depending on what floor of the hotel it's on, and each room you prepare must be adjacent to an already prepared room. Remember that the room has to be prepared before a guest will stay in it. So if I were able to prepare two rooms, I could prepare this one and this one, costing me two money in total. Action four is about gaining money and or moving your marker on the Emperor track. I'll explain the Emperor track later. Action five is a little different. It allows you to play one staff card from your hand and only one, but the number of dice in that section is the discount you get. You start the game with six staff cards, and when played, these give you all kinds of special abilities or ways to score more victory points, and the cost to play them is shown in the top right. Action six is a bit special. It allows you to pay one money, and you can do any of the other five actions based on the number of dice in the six space that there are. So in this example, there are no two dice, but let's say I really needed to take wine, then I could choose the six column, pay one money, and do the wine and coffee action twice. So how do you complete the requests of the guests? Well, whenever you take cubes, you can put them straight onto the guests. But also during your turn, you can spend one money to move up to three cubes from your kitchen onto a guest. And once the guest has all its needs fulfilled, they agree to stay in your hotel, but there must be a room of the correct color available, which is why the color of the rooms is important. Except for the green guests, they're not fussy and they'll stay anywhere. You get the victory points shown on the card and the bonus at the bottom. You discard the guest card and flip the room tile over. Notice that the rooms are arranged into groups. Once you complete a group with occupied rooms, you get a bonus based on the colour and size of the group. This is shown at the top of your player board. So completing a blue group gives you victory points, completing a red group gives you money, and completing a yellow group gives you movement on the Emperor track. At the end of rounds three, five and seven, there's an emperor scoring phase and three emperor tiles have been chosen at random at the start of the game and placed here. During the emperor scoring, you're gonna get additional victory points based on where you are on the emperor track, but then your marker is moved back a certain number of spaces. 
And then after that, if you're in the yellow section, you get the bonus shown on the Emperor tile. And if you're at the bottom of the track, you get the penalty. Finally, there's also three politics cards placed at random at the start of the game. These are like objective cards and give you extra points if you manage to achieve the goal that's printed on them. And you'll get more points if you achieve them first. At the end of the game, you'll get extra points for each occupied room in your hotel and for certain staff cards, but you'll lose points for any food and drink left in your kitchen, and you'll also lose five points for each guest still in your cafe. And the one with the most points at the end of the game wins! Firstly, the choosing the dice from a pool mechanic I think is really interesting. I know a few other games have used this, but what happens in this game, it's a really interesting twist on that normal dice pool mechanic. What I didn't mention in the overview is that you can always, on your turn, you can spend one money to effectively increase the number of dice in the action space that you can take. So although it may seem that you've only got the six actions, there's actually a couple of extra things going on that make the decisions a little bit more interesting. Speaking of things going on in the game, there's actually quite a bit, which is a kind of game that I like. I class this as a medium weight game. There's a lot going on for you. You've got obviously the guests, the requirements, the rooms where you put them, because each floor has got a higher cost, but is worth more victory points. Then you've got the groups, then you've got your own staff cards. You've also got the three different emperor rewards and you've got the politics. There's a lot. So there's a lot going on to think about on your turn. And although it is just as simple as, oh, choose a dice, take it and do the action, there's a lot more to it than that. And I really like that. I think the replayability of the game is also pretty good because I mentioned the Emperor tiles and you choose three of them at the start of the game. That's three out of a possible 12. And it's the same with the politics cards. Again, you choose three out of a possible 12. So every time you play the game, it will play out differently because your short term and long term goals have been defined at the start of the game by those cards and tiles, and, and they will change each time you play. Obviously the dice, the way that they come out as well, that will change the game somewhat. But yeah, I think the replayability is good. Overall, the component quality is pretty good. The card stock's good. Uh, the cardboard tiles punched out really well and are a good thickness. Uh, the rule book's pretty good. Four of us actually played this one night in Essen and we all four of us learned how to play from the rule book. And apart from one thing we got wrong, which was no fault of the rule book, it was down to our tiredness, um, we all managed to play the game successfully, as I say, learning from the rule book. So apart from one little bit of casual racism towards Scottish people in the rule book, which was a little bit weird, uh, and another case where it said, put some cards on the indicated space and there wasn't an indicated space. Apart from that, it was actually pretty good. So going back to the rule book again, I said overall it was pretty good, but there is one thing about it that, that didn't really work. Now the staff cards, there's lots of different staff cards and they all have different abilities. Now for your first few games, you're gonna need to look those abilities up in the rule book because although the iconography is fairly, is pretty good, then you know when you're learning the game, you are gonna to have to look it up. So when you look it up, unfortunately, the cards were not numbered. So you have to look it up based on the name of the card, which is fine, except the name of the card is in a really tiny spindly little font. So actually trying to read it and then look that up in the rule book was actually quite difficult. So I think this could have easily been fixed simply by numbering the cards and then having them listed by the number in the rule book. Would have made it a lot better. The other thing I personally didn't like about the game is the way that some aspects of it had a theme forced onto it. Now, for those people who know me, I'm a mechanics whore. A game needs to have good mechanics and I'm interested. If there's a theme as well, then, then that's great. But when there is a mechanic in the game and then there was like, oh, we need a thematic explanation for this. Let's call it that. But it doesn't actually fit. That kind of irks me a bit. So the politics cards are the main thing I'm referring to. These cards are nothing to do with politics whatsoever. They're objective cards. They tell you what you can do to earn bonus victory points. And that's it. If they'd have called them objective cards or goal cards, I wouldn't have had any problem with it whatsoever. But it's like they felt, oh, we need to put a theme onto this. Um, politics. Let's call them politics cards. And as I say, they're nothing to do with politics at all. So it's just a minor quibble, but that, that was my opinion of it. Finally, when you're playing with four players, downtime can be a bit of an issue, especially if you've got some players that are prone to analysis paralysis. Now, the way that the turn order works is good. You know, the player who goes first 
takes his first action, but then will take the last action. Now, that means that there can be quite a bit of downtime between it. I'm not going to go as far as some other people and said, oh God, never play this with four. Just be aware that if you do play it with four, then there can be a bit of downtime. I've played this with four a few times and I've enjoyed it. Um, I think three is probably the sweet spot of the game, but as I say, I've enjoyed it with four. It did run to between two, two and a half hours though. Most times when I've played this with, with new players and it's a four player game, it is about two and a half hours. And I, I think that a kind of game like this should probably be about 90 minutes to two hours at the max. So yeah, it does run a little long, but still lots of interesting decisions on the way. Overall, I liked the game and I would happily play it again. It's got enough interesting decisions going on in the game and enough replayability that does keep me interested. So yep, gaming rules approved. If you like what you've seen here and wanna see more of my videos, please subscribe to the channel and check them out. Until then, take care and thanks for watching. <laughs>